Good evening, everyone. Good evening, everyone. The sun came out. We're, it's not raining. Good evening. I'm Betty Hager Francis, and I serve as Deputy County Manager for Health, Human Services, and Education for County Executive Rashern Baker, who is our convener for this evening. Also with us are Prince George's County Public Schools CEO, Kevin Maxwell, and <laughs> Dr. Alvin Thornton. And did I say that our convener is right here with us? Yes, yes. <laughs> County Executive Assured Al Baker III. Thank you so much for joining us this evening about uh, right-sizing our county's investment in our children and in our schools. I'd like to recognize uh, our uh, Board of Education Vice Chair, Carol Boston. <laughs> Member of the Board of Education, Sabrina Epps. thank Principal John Mangrum and the entire staff of the right. Dwight Eisenhower Middle School for hosting the conversation. And I'd like to ask uh, uh, Dr. Mangrum to please join us for a few greetings, please. Schools. 
The proposed investment of over $130 million is intended to move our school system from being consistently ranked 23rd out of 24 in Maryland to being in the top 10 by 2020. This rapid improvement of our school system will occur as a result of implementing the programs in the brand new strategic plan um, published by the county school system. The infusion of funds, this new infusion of funds, will be used to implement the programs in the strategic plan. It's going to require some sacrifice from all of us. That is an increase of 15 cents in the real property tax, an increase of 38 cents in the personal property tax rate, and a 4% increase in the telecommunications tax rate. Um, I'm, and I want to say at the outset that there are folks who are senior citizens um, who may be uh, earning less than $60,000 a year, and this will have very little, if any, effect on those individuals. Um, at this time, I'd like to ask Dr. Al Alvin Thornton to please uh, bring some remarks to us. The button's on the bottom. I'm uh, deeply uh, honored to uh, be with you all this evening uh, and to be with our county executive and uh, the leader of our, of our school system uh, to participate in this uh, discussion about uh, the core of our community, which is public education. I think they've, uh, they've asked me to participate because I'm uh, one of the elder statesmen uh, who's been around for a long time. Uh, and I've been, I've been engaged in discussions of public education George's County uh, for more than 35 years. Um, I am a father and a grandfather and former chairman of the school board and chairman of the Reform Commission, which we'll talk about a little bit more because I think it's important to contextualize what we're trying to do. Uh, what our county executive and our superintendent of schools, our CEO of schools, and, and I think the community is trying to do is to reposition the public education concept in Prince George's County which has been treated almost like a football, up and down, chasing after misinformation, chasing after aspirations of the public, trying to uh, make itself competitive within the region and in the nation, and indeed within the state. It's, it can be very frustrating if we don't come together as a community and get factual information uh, that allows us not to caricature, caricature ourselves allows us to understand the history of how we came to be what we are in terms of the funding of our public schools. See, we recall that in the 1990s in this county and in this state, we decided to raise the expectations for our children. I call them our babies. We decided to raise them to very, very high levels. And we imposed uh, state tests on our children. Maryland School Performance Assessment, Maryland School Assessment, third, fourth, and fifth grade, all of that was good. What we did not associate with those high expectations was adequate funding and equitable funding for the children. Now for me as a parent of two daughters in the schools, that was very frustrating and during that period because you had people saying, perform on these tests, if you don't graduate, if you don't perform on the tests, you won't graduate from school. It's very frustrating. Our schools were ranked one to 23, we're always 23 out of 24. It's based on those tests. You've got to realize that's where that 23 comes from. Right? So if we don't have a system in the county, however we get to it, and I want to celebrate our county exec and the leadership for being able to be bold to force us to talk about the funding needs of our babies so they can pass these tests. That's where that 23 comes from. We decided then to attach funding, require <coughs> funding at the state level to what it takes to pass these tests. That's where the so-called Thornton funding comes from. We said that this is what it requires to pass these tests. We went to schools throughout the state and found 100 schools where kids are passing the tests and doing very well on the tests. And we said, how much are they spending on those babies? And we said, if they're spending that on those babies there, they should, we should be spending that on the babies here. How we do it is what we're talking about. I think the county executives put on the table proposal that is worthy, we need to look at it, but we 
need to understand the historical context. When the governor asked me to chair the Fulton Commission in 1999, I chaired it for two years, and county exec now, uh, now county exec and others in general assembly supported it. We historically funded education in the state of Maryland at a nationally unprecedented level as a result. Most of that money went to two places, Baltimore City and Prince George's County for our children. Now we're in a major fight right now in order to preserve that money, $68 million, $20 million coming to Prince George's County. But there was one question, Mr. County Executive and CEO of Maxwell, that I could not answer as the chair of that commission that the people of Maryland asked me. They said, Dr. Thornton, we're giving you all more money than anyone else from the rest of the state of Maryland. But for whatever reason, you all are not supporting your schools funding these at the level that you should. I could not answer that. I was, we were getting more money from all the other counties, and I'm sitting there, right, getting that money with my colleagues with the support of the General Assembly. I could not answer that question. And colleagues, citizens, fellow Chris Georgians, I still can't answer. I was in Annapolis, and I'll shut up after this. I was in Annapolis uh, yesterday, Mr. County Day, asking the governor with, with the other leaders to release $68 million for public education, $20 million coming from Chris Georgians. I'm sitting there asking Governor Hogan to do what? Release that money. How can I have a straight face <clears throat> if he looks at me and says, Dr. Thornton, what are you doing for yourself? So that's the dilemma we, we find ourselves in. I, I think that this kind of town hall, coming to the people, getting your input, working with the county council, working with the general assembly, to get the people's input so that we can fund our schools adequately and we'll not uh, put the burden on our schools to have large class sizes, teachers leaving, lack of professional development, et cetera and that we will have competitive schools for our children. Because it, clearly one thing I know, having been in Prince George's for, for more than three decades, if we don't fund our schools competitively, anything else we want to do in terms of economic development, quality of, the, of our homes, value of our homes, et cetera, that will not be competitive in the reason. So I'm happy to be here to join the, the, the county executive as well as our CEO to engage with you in this discussion and to help provide the background and start and thank you, Mr. Cummings, thank you for letting me participate. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Thornton. I'd like to recognize our delegate, Jocelyn Pena Melnick, who has arrived. And also representing Councilwoman Mary Lehman, Bridget Warren. And now let's get this conversation going. Here's the first question. I'm not in agreement with the tax increase proposal. Here are the questions. What happened to revenue from the casinos that was designated for schools? I'm gonna, there are a lot of questions on this card. So, I, and I think there are a lot of, these questions are questions that a lot of people have. So I'm really going to, to use these questions. Um, so what happened to the revenue from the casinos that was designated for schools? Very good. Very good question. We get that um, everywhere we go. So the casinos were passed, and, um, and Thomas is going to help me out. Tom, can you stand up? Is this Thomas Himmler? Budget guy? Come on up, Tom. Tom's going to tell us about the casinos. So we've got MGM coming to Prince George's County. Once MGM comes here, which is, should be online 2016, uh, we estimate when revenues come in, the county portion will be about $41 million a year in funding. The education portion of casinos goes to the state. The state then does its own formula and it comes back to us in education money. So the question is, Thomas, where's our casino money and why can't I use it today to fund this uh, education system? Why is that? Thank you, sir. Um, as the county executive said, the state of Maryland provides about $5 billion a year for, for funding for schools. The, 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 the money from the casinos generates right now about $350 million a year that goes into a trust fund. So what the casino money does is help kind of supplement the existing state funding. But the way the funding works is 
the, as Dr. Thornton alluded to, one of the issues is, is the money flows to, from, from the casinos to the state, to the state, to the school system. So the money that, that Dr. Thor Dr. Maxwell gets is only as good as what the state funds are formally. So for example, Dr. Thornton was talking about there, there was a rally in Annapolis to fight for an additional $68 million of funding from the state. Well, you know, if the state doesn't fund it, then, then we don't get it. So the casinos could generate millions and millions of dollars, but if the state decides to cut back on, on the funding, we don't get it. So, but the money is locked away and for education only. It's not used for anything else, um, but, but that, that's how it works. So it does help support education funding because in, over the history, including when he was a delegate, there was always an urge to take money away from the, the education funding because it's such a big portion of the state's budget. About 30% of the state's budget is, is education funding. So when people on the, on the Eastern Shore want to get a road project funded or something else, they always fight to try to pull money away from, from, the, from the counties like us who get the most money. And so, it's, so that's why we work hard with, with Delegate Melnick, Penny Melnick and others to make sure that the governor funds these formulas because it's only as good as what, what, what they do. So that money from the casino, when it comes in for education, will be the amount of resources that the state will put toward Twin Prince George's County. So right now what happens, and this is what Dr. Thornton was talking about, the state puts in 55% of the money that goes to Prince George's County. We put in about 35%. Compare that with our neighbors. Montgomery County puts up of their dollars 66%. Their dollars, their residents, funding their school system, their children, their property values, 66%. Howard County, 69%. Their dollars, their residents, their property values, their children, putting into their system. So it doesn't get bought up in the, uh, in, the, uh, in the state. If we go to Fairfax County, these are our competitors. This is where we are. We're in the Washington region. This is who our children compete against. This is who we compete against for, for uh, businesses to come here. Fairfax County, 69% of Fairfax County, their resources. So when we asked about the casino, yes, when it's online, somewhere around 2018, we're gonna get $41 million that are, that's Prince George's County's dollars. We can use that how we want. But until then, we have to wait for what the state is gonna give us. Right now, we're fighting for $20 million asking the governor to give that to us. I don't know if he'll give it to us. We don't know, but we have to educate our children. The bottom line for us is, if we want a quality school system, we have to support it. The reason we have the ability right now to raise property taxes for education it's because the state got sick and tired of funding our education without us putting in money. That's the bottom line. They got tired of it. Because if Prince George's County, with a couple of other jurisdictions, would go to the state and say, we need more money. The state would say, great, how much are you putting in? They said, well, we can't. We got a property tax cap. We got trim. We can't put any money in. That worked for a while until the economy got bad. Then they were like, no. You know why? Because Montgomery County, Howard County, Anne Arundel County, Albert County, all these other places said, you know what? If you're not putting in your money, why am I taking it out of our residence and putting it in Prince George's County? They said, okay, here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna allow you, when the Rochelle Baker built, I didn't go down there and ask for it. Didn't lobby for it, didn't know we had it. Until I asked for money. Then they said, whoa, 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 you want money? Get it from your residents, their school system. They passed the bill allowing us to do it only for education. These dollars can't go to help the rest of our budget, which we're cutting, which we're laying off people, which we're furloughing people. None of these dollars can help in that respect. It can only go toward education. So the casino money, when it comes in, we can use it. But it's not coming in for a while. And the only education money coming from the state is depending on them to have the goodwill to give it to us. Slow on that. 
take there, Mr. Baker. <laughs> so Doris Reed has come in, who is the president of the Association of Supervisory and Administrative School Presidents. And here she is. Next question, but a similar question is, what happened to the res uh, revenue from the Maryland State Lottery that was designated for schools? Hello. Would you like to tell us what happened to that money? Because I could sure use it. It's kind of the same thing, and, and this, the, the, the lottery money goes to the state's general fund, and it helps fund a lot of things. One of the lessons they learned from that was the need to put essentially a lockbox like they did on the casinos to do for the education trust fund. So the lottery goes into the big pot of money that the state gets, and that goes to fund a variety of things. Thank you. Um, next question. We have a high amount of foreclosures due to high property taxes, amongst other reasons. Why not plan to put families into these properties to increase revenue? Well, we are, we are planning. That's a good question. One of the things around foreclosures we're doing, and we've started from the very beginning of the administration, is really working with the state uh, for the last four years to access state funding and also federal funding to get those houses you know, out of the foreclosure and off the market as, as quickly as possible. Um, one of the reasons that we're not seeing the rebound that our neighbors saw in terms of foreclosures and getting, them, getting the houses off the market, getting them filled in, I mean, everybody in this whole region went through this uh, economic downturn. One of the reasons they don't get off the market as quickly in Prince George's County is because the value of the property is not as great as our surrounding competitors. So they rebound faster. The only reason the value of the properties is not as great is not the quality of the house. It's not the location of the house in terms of the neighborhood. It's not crime. Crime is at an all-time low, down all-time low in Prince George's County. It's not the prospects of economic development. We've got $6 billion worth of economic development that's happening around the county. It's only one thing that keeps our property value lower than the people across the, across the way, whether it's Howard County or Montgomery County or Fairfax County. It's our school system. It's much harder to say to somebody, hey, I got this great property that was on the foreclosure market. If you're a bank and say, I want to, there are two properties up for sale. One that's near uh, Wooten High School, that high school in Montgomery sure. County, and one that's near, let's take mine, Bladesburg. The one in Wooten, which is one of the top schools, I believe, is going to go faster and for more. The one in Bladesburg is going to take longer. So if you want to see this rebound and recovery happen, we've got to invest in the thing that is the, represent, is the reputation of the jurisdiction. When you hear people say Fairfax County is great, Howard County is great, Arlington County is great, all of that means is they have a great school system. Only place that gets away with not having a great school system and people move into it is a city. That's why DC can be the way it is. That's why Baltimore City can see corporations come in here. That's why Philadelphia can be the way it is. If you are a county, your reputation is your school system, and your public safety. Public safety here is great, it's education, so that's why we're not rebounding. But we are looking at other ways to use it. But we need a great school system, that's why this is so important. Retirees are leaving in droves because the state and county taxes are just too high. Why not look for ways to tighten our belts in order not to raise taxes? I love that question. First of all, for retirees and people on a fixed income, we are, how much do you want to tell them what we're doing? You know, one of the things that, the, 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 as part of this, this, this process, we've, we've discovered, the state of Maryland has an existing program, homeowner's tax credit. So if your household income is 60,000 or below, your net assets are less than 200,000, and you own the house, you can get a cap on your tax on your taxes. So one of the things we've discovered in looking at this is that a lot of folks don't know about the existing program. So so for folks who are in this program now, this tax proposal will not impact you whatsoever because your taxes are capped. And, and one of the things we're, we're, we're hoping to come out of this is that there's, there's about 4,500 households right now that benefit from this program. 
If you compare us to, to other counties who are wealthier than us, they either have more or are very close. We should be another two or 3,000 households at least higher because of our income levels. And one of the things we're hoping is, from all these different forums, is that folks become aware of the existing program because one, a lot of people may actually get a tax break because you may have been overpaying if you fit the, the eligibility requirements under this existing state program. One of the things we're proposing to do is enhance the, that program by doing a county supplemental that would take it up to $70,000. It would apply solely to the education tax to, to essentially cap the amount of, of education tax that, that that block of folks would, would, would pay. We think that that will add another 5,000 or so homes, the homeowners who would get captured by that. So, so those are, we are mindful of that, and that was one of the reasons why we structured it the way we structured it. But if you're interested and you think you may qualify, please speak to me afterwards. We'll make sure that you get the forms, because you have to file annually to get it. And we know for a fact we're worth several thousand home, homeowners below where we should be. And the overall budget for the county is about $4 billion? $3.6. $3.6 billion. The other part that the county council is discussing right now is the other part, the general part of the budget. That means the, the part of the budget that doesn't deal with education, that deals with everything else to run this county. On that side of the ledger, what we've done is we've cut. We've asked every department in the county, whether it's health, social services, family services, um, transportation, uh, public works, you name it, every single government department of Prince George's County, we've asked the directors to cut their staff and cut their budget by 5%. That's everybody. In addition to that, what we're proposing is that we actually lay off. That means people who have jobs right now who are paying taxes, who are paying a mortgage, 110 of those employees, we're proposing to lay off. In addition, we're asking for five days of furloughs, including myself, for actual people who pay taxes and pay mortgages. Because what we don't want to do is increase the spending side of the general budget. The only place, the only two places, where we're actually taking the revenues that we have and spending money toward it is our police department, fire department, corrections, state's attorneys. People who have to deal with public safety are going to see an increase. Everybody else gets cut. And some people lose their job. The only place where we're asking this revenue to go is education. Dr. Maxwell and his leadership team and the school board control the education budget. That means I, neither myself nor the council, can use any of the money we're proposing to deal with hiring staff on the county executive side or the county council side, hiring for uh, Director Moe, who's Homeland Security. He can't use any of this money. On that side of the budget, they're losing. So we're making sure the fiscal house of Prince George's County is in order. The only thing we're doing is investing on the other side that will help us attract more businesses, bring up the value of homes, and make this a place where people want to come to. Thank you. 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 I see waste daily, specifically with the busing of homeless students. Why not rewrite the guidelines so that these students will attend the school in the neighborhood where they reside instead of sending buses all over the county to transport them when in most cases there's only one, there are only one or two students on a bus? So, so because federal law requires that. Bottom line, that's the federal government says that when children become homeless, and they attend Laurel High School, and they might now be in a homeless shelter in, you know, Bowie or Adelphi, they are allowed under the federal law to attend their school. And so you have choices about buses or thing, or taxi cab fares or whatever the right answer. But we're required uh, to transport them. And that's fine. Thank you. I, and you may call that waste. I'm calling it the law because I'd be in trouble if I didn't follow the law. <laughs> the school's administration building personnel seem top heavy. 
why not begin there? So uh, I disagree with that uh, completely. Uh, during the, the Great Recession in particular, uh, the, the school system lost a tremendous amount of people who write curriculum to, to hand to our teachers to, to teach lessons. Uh, they, they lost uh, teachers. We have a very, very low, uh, related to the state guidelines from mentor teachers, we have a very low uh, ratio. We're not anywhere near the, the suggested guidelines for, for mentor teachers. Uh, since 2009, on the executive level staff, not my immediate team, but on the executive level staff, I think we're 19 people less in the executive level of this organization than we were in 2009. So, you know, I just, I just disagree. But I would also say that, you know, we're a really big organization. I don't think people understand that. You know, we have, uh, uh, we, are one, we are the 17th largest school district in the United States. We have, on any given day, with substitutes and temps, of 20 to 22,000 people who work for our school system. You have to have people do payroll, do HR, do auditing, uh, do, do security services, do curriculum instruction, do psychological services. Um, I mean, it, it takes a lot to run that system and support our teachers and, and uh, you know, and do the evaluation, you know, requirements that, that we have. Um, and so, you know, I, I absolutely disagree that we're, we're top heavy. If you look at the Maryland fact book, I think the latest figures for that are probably 2013. Uh, it'll, it'll give you like mid-level management and those kind of things and compare by district. And you'll see that with, uh, you know, the other large districts in Maryland that we compare quite favorably, actually. Let me, do, let me take this, because um, the question that, that was asked was the same question I asked to Dr. Maxwell. When he came in and said, you know, we need additional revenues to move this school system from 23rd or 24th to the top 10. First thing we said to him was, I don't want the money, the additional money, going toward hiring more people at Sasser. I don't want the money going to a program that already existed somewhere else that didn't move us up. Tell me where, if we're gonna ask people to invest they need to know we're investing in something that we know will work and that we haven't been doing for 30 years that kept us where we are. So part of what you will see if you go and look at how this money is spent is line has never been done before. Line item by line item, where we're spending the money. Thomas, did you not sit down with them and go through each portion of this? Where the money, so the $133 million we're giving to the school system, or you're investing in the school system, is targeted toward program. Not staffers at Sasser, not county administration people, but programs that we've seen either work or programs that we want to expand to give other people the opportunity so that not the homeless uh, students that come here, but other parents who are looking for a quality education who are form shopping. I heard they got a great education uh, system here at, at Eisenhower. So I want to come up here for sixth grade. I want to go to Tasker for middle school. We want to have those programs throughout. But each line item in that budget spells out what we're spending. So if you want to know what we're going to spend to retain teachers and make sure they stay here in good principles, it's there. I think it's 40, you know what I'm the time? Uh, 20 million dollars. 20 million for that. For parent and, and community engagement, $1 million, about $1.1 million in there. So, but each line item is broke down, because what we don't want to have is what has happened in the past. And this is why I was unwilling to do this when it first came out, is to have a superintendent say, if you just give me money, it'll improve. Well, how the, hell, how the heck do I know <laughs> that that's going to happen? How can I hold you accountable if I just give it to you in a lump sum and you promise me? I need to be able to track it by line item and see what progress. That's why this is different than, than it's done before. We know which line item is in there, and we know how to hold not only Dr. Maxwell, but to hold me accountable. To hold me accountable. Because that's what we ask for. What will the implementation of the strategic plan look like for the schools in law? 
Great question. So, uh, so first, uh, I see a lot of people with ink pens. At, at uh, www1, www1, number one, dot pgcps dot org, O-R-G, slash promise. Put that in, and up will come the strategic plan. And you can go, there's a couple of different you know, places that you can click on. The bottom one says the plan in your school, or something almost exactly like that. Click on that, open it up, and every school in Prince George's County is listed. And it will go across, it came live uh, night before last, so tonight will be a couple more hours or so from now, it will be up for 48 hours now. So it will tell you things like here at, at Dwight Eisenhower Middle School, how are you doing back there, Mr. Principal? If, you know, in this budget, in order to get where we want to go, uh, next year in additional funds for their school-based budget, the budget they have control over, they'll receive an additional $150,000 uh, to decide how to support the children here at Eisenhower. We've been putting principals and their leadership teams in these terrible positions where they've been having to decide whether to have a teacher to lower class size or a, an assistant principal to help manage the school, whether they're going to have an art teacher or a reading specialist, whether they're going to have a classroom teacher or a reading specialist. You know, those are really not very good decisions to put our, our principals in. Uh, and they'll receive a literacy coach, a full-time literacy coach to work with children on reading skills and numeracy skills, math skills, uh, who are behind so that they can assist classroom teachers either by pushing into classrooms or pulling kids out to help them get caught up on the skills that they need support in. Uh, we're, we're starting uh, the literacy coach rollout in the county uh, at the secondary schools because we are so intently focused uh, on the graduation requirement. And we're adding uh, gifted uh, specialists at um, our elementary schools and in the original rollout. So at Montpelier Elementary School, they'll get an additional $81,759, they're going to get a, a gifted tag specialist. They'll receive uh, tablets for their children in grades three and five, and some additional funds for, for professional development in the amount of $32,558. Uh, Laurel High School will get a, a literacy coach and an additional $301,829 in uh, school-based budgeting of funds. High Point High School We'll get an additional $408,630 in school-based budgeting funds and a literacy coach. Uh, Martin Luther King Jr. will get an additional uh, $110,947,000 for their school-based budget and a literacy coach. So it goes like that. I won't, you know, I can pull up my uh, my phone and go to the rest of them. But the idea here is to make an impact in schools and, and to make an impact in schools quickly. We made an impact last year. We had a great increase uh, in, in uh, graduation rate, in ninth grade promotion rates, second grade reading scores and the like. Uh, but what we need to do is, is uh, really expand that work. We know that we have uh, some significant issues around uh, reading and numeracy skills. And so we know schools need some support in that area. We know that we have a lot more kids that can do higher level work and are doing it because they don't have the resources. We know that we have issues with class size. You know, when I visited every, I had people ask me some of these questions last night. When I visited every one of the over 200 schools in this district last year, which, which took a lot of time, over about 52 equivalent days, some of them were half days, some of them were full days, uh, but the equivalent of about 52 days of, of my work year, uh, and I, I think it was well invested. But, you know, I've got elementary school classes, class sizes in the, in the low 30s. It's ridiculous. I found advanced placement classes in high schools. All right, I want you to, you know, advanced placement classes, it's college level work. I walked into classrooms with, with advanced placement English in high schools in this county where the teachers had 42 and 43 kids in an AP English class. Now, how do you expect a teacher to teach a kid college level English, right, with that kind of class load? And wait a minute, you know, we have, we're on an eight period day, they teach six periods. And sometimes they're teaching two or three of those classes. 
I mean, you, you can do the math in your heads. I mean, how do you give the kids the kind of attention they need, the quality of work they need, grade the papers that they need, do the lesson plans they need, when you're carrying class loads like that? I mean, that's part of what the school-based mo budgeting money is for, and it's part of what additional teachers that we've added to our budget have gone for, is to, is to help our teachers be able to do the job that we're asking them to do and to give the principals and their leadership team some ability to really make a difference with their school-based budget. Because again, they're making these terrible uh, choices between having a, a reading specialist in their school or a, you know, a, a seventh grade language arts teacher or, ma or math teacher. And that, that's just not a, a good choice for them to have to make. And, and again, we're talking about numbers, we're talking about a strategic plan, but you know, I always tell people, look, we're really talking about children here. And we're really talking about opportunities that we're providing to the children in our schools. And, and um, you know, I feel you know, really, really strong uh, that we can't lose sight of that conversation. Let me just add uh, one thing on to what Dr. Maxwell said. And that is, because it's important, uh, what's going to happen in school. One of the things this is not, this budget we're proposing to the council, it is not what my signature program is, which is our Transforming Neighborhoods Initiative, where we look at the six areas, challenging areas of Prince George's County, and we take that limited amount of resources we have in the county and the general fund, and we focus on those areas like a laser beam. That ain't this. The idea of this budget that we're proposing and this increase is that we impact all 500 square miles of this county. That is both our challenging schools and our schools that are doing a lot better. So that we bring everybody up at the same time. Which is why the infusion is the amount that it's in. So that means every single school district in Prince George's County should feel the impact of this budget. That's what happens when you fund schools adequately to the amount that they need to bring everybody up. When you just cherry pick or do like we've done in the past, where we've done, and we could have done it this year, we could have said, okay, we're gonna give you a 2% increase. That may trickle down to some schools in some areas who desperately need it. What it won't do is impact every single school in the 500 square miles of this county. That means from Laurel to Eagle Harbor, wherever it is. Thank you. That's right. Everybody. Everybody. Because we're asking everybody to sacrifice. So that's what this is. This is not how we cherry pick. This is making sure it feels directly in the schools and every principal and every student, every parent, and everybody's property. Next question is, how will the school system compensate for the $20 million deficit from the state? Uh, I can answer that one. Thomas, can you, how, where are we going to get that money from, Thomas? That's a good what question, sir. Um, I was reaching in my pocket. I don't have $20 million, but, um, No, that's one of the things we're going to look at because um, the... the, the the, the budget that the county executive proposed had certain assumptions for state aid. It looks like at this point they're about $5 million less than what we sent down. So we're going to have to you know, uh, continue dialoguing with the county council to figure out you know, how do we close that gap or what other adjustments we have to make. I think it's also, I know people use the uh, $20 million figure, and that is the, it's $20.2 million for the Geographic Cost of Education Index that you've been hearing a lot about in the media in the last few weeks. Uh, but there's another $5 million had the formulas not been adjusted, and that taxable income and, and some other uh, tweaks to the formula. And so while, while both of the arguments are somewhat true, it is true that we got additional funding over last year from the state, but we got $25 million less than we would have gotten if the if the GCI adjustment and other adjustments to, uh, to the state funding for schools uh, than, than if we had gotten last year, for example. So, uh, and then, and I would just say very clearly, you know, $20.2 million is not all of GCI that we get. We actually get about $40 million from the state GCI. And so we don't receive GCI this year, you know, depending on what happens with the state legislature. I'm, pretty sure I'm going to lose as a school district and we're going to lose as a county another $20 million next year. 
I mean, we should be really clear that, that it's only half of the GCI funding that we get. And if it goes this year, what's to say the other half doesn't go next year? That's, Here, that's a big word. Right, here's the bottom line. The, the legislature is out. They, they signed out, they're gone. We're not gonna get the money. So somebody asked, where do we get the money from? We don't have it. We don't have it. We could lay off some more employees and see if we can come up with it that way. That's the only thing we have. I can't raise revenues any other way. So the money that we're actually putting toward our school system, that's why it's important for us to invest in our school system. What the state says when I go down there is the governor doesn't have a printing press in his bag that prints money. I can't relate to that, because I don't have one either. But nobody gives us back all the money we sent to the state and says, hey, or, you know. They say, you know what? No one says, hey, what are you going to do to make sure that there is a teacher in front of every student in Prince George's County? That's our problem. Once they send us back whatever it is, they say, make it work. If we're going to have a great school system, we have to believe in ourselves, our students, our superintendent, our board of education, that they can do this. And we're gonna to have to invest in it. You know, it's not me. You know, I don't get to decide how he spends the money or the schools, the board of education spends the money. It's my believing that if we're gonna have the best school system, we have to invest in ourselves, because nobody else will. The state has already sent a signal this year. They are not giving us any more money. But what they are giving us is more of the tax burden. We get the teacher's pension, right? Yep, we get that. That's right. We get stormwater management. Did they take any of that? Did they give us money for the federal mandate for the, what they call the rain tax? Anybody send us some money comments that I didn't see? Nope, we get it. Federal mandate, they give it to us. So for education, if we want to have a great school system, if you want to see great teachers in front of your students, if you want to see your property values go up, it's now on you. That's what they said, you on your own. So in line with that question, there's a follow-up question. What cuts will be made at the, at the system-wide level and then the impact at the local school level for cuts? So because of the $20 million or because, because of the $20 million? So the net adjustment, again, we got more money from the state, just $25 million less. So it's not a one-to-one -one, uh, cut. We're five or $6 million overall less uh, than, than the state funding. Uh, again, uh, our enrollment went up for the first time in nine years. Uh, we, we went from nine straight years of decline in enrollment uh, to 3,600 student growth over the last 20 months. So we got some additional revenue from the state because of that and an adjustment in the formula that they have because of our relationship to other districts relative to poverty. Uh, so um, there's a part of the formula that is, you know, your poverty can stay the same, but if others improves, then yours is relatively worse than another districts. And so that's part of the formula. So, so we got an increase uh, but not what we had anticipated from the state, what we thought we were going to get overall from the state. So, uh, but I think that, you know, partly we're waiting to see, again, how the, the county acts, but uh, it's a sum total game. You know, at the end of the process, we're going to look at how much uh, revenue does the county provide to us, how much did the state provide to us, and then what do we need to do in terms of adjusting that. So the county council is, has to vote on this budget by the end of uh, May and give it back to us by uh, the 1st of June. And then we have, as a school system, uh, until the end of June, we have two, two board meetings scheduled, I think, in, in June. Uh, the second one is June 20-something. And, and we will um, have to adjust our budget, balance our budget to whatever that amount is. So I can't tell you exactly right now where we're going to fall out, because if the county gives us all of the 100 and 33 million that we asked for, we're $5 million on the state. I mean, you know, it's not a huge amount of reductions, but, but if the county council doesn't approve the budget, now you have to be really clear. Everything that I just read to you for the schools in District 1 isn't gonna happen. 
because I won't have the money to do it. And we'll have to figure out, you know, what to do about other things. So, you know, so pick, pick one. There won't be literacy coaches. There won't be gifted specialists. There won't be the ability to negotiate with our uh, uh, bargaining units to talk about making our salaries more competitive. And on, the, on that competitiveness, I mean, people can say, oh, well, you know, let me just be really clear. We have about 9,500, 9,600 teachers in the district, right? It's a big district, said that, 128,000 kids. So since 2007, eight school year, it's a long time ago, right? No, it's really not, it's not that long ago. We've replaced 7,100 teachers. So any of you all in business or other organizations, try turning over that much in seven or eight years and be successful. Our teachers, by the time they're with us, that same seven or eight years, are making ten to $15,000 less than Montgomery County, for example, depending on uh, the salary lane that they're on. 7,100 teachers we've had to replace since the seven, eight school year. Teachers that we paid to recruit, that we paid to train, that got valuable experience in Prince George's County and went somewhere else. Some of them retired, but a bunch of them went somewhere else to make more money. Right? We're left with profession because they didn't have enough mentor teachers, enough support. So, you know, we have a lot of things that we need to, to do to, to help improve our school district. I do want to say this. Uh, I think the county executive and our school leadership are doing the correct thing, and that is to for whatever cuts or might come from the state, but um, I do believe that the governor still has the discretion to release those funds. And so I would ask you to, uh, the legislature has ended, but the governor still has to make a decision. And so he should hear from you. He should hear from you as citizens to release those funds. That is a political decision that he should make. And when you call him, you tell him that the, the primary responsibility that he has as governor is to fund public education and to make sure that there are taxes available to do that. Nothing else is constitutionally required before that. So that's a political decision I would ask you. I'm glad that my colleagues are doing what they have to do to, to prepare, but it's still a governor's decision. Thank you, Dr. Thorpe. This is, a, this is an interesting question. Um, why are Head Start and Free <coughs> Kindergarten um, not for all kids? That is, why do we have to prove our income if all kids have the same right of education? So, so Head Start is a federally uh, run program. It's not, you know, it, it, they have their rules about who's eligible to participate in Head Start. Our pre-kindergarten has no such, uh, no such standard with the pre-kindergartens that we're rolling out across the district right now. And in this budget, uh, there's another 67 all day uh, pre-Ks are rolled out. Now I will say that the state guidelines do start with the priorities, okay? So, so they don't have a mandate, a hard mandate, but it's based on how many seats you have. So if you don't have enough seats for every child, if you don't have a universal pre-K in your district, then the first priority kids are the highest poverty kids, and then there's another level of priority, and there's I think four levels of that priority until you get there. So our goal is to roll out all day universal pre-K for our entire school district, for every child, regardless of how much they make. But until we get to that point, you know, we do have to go by the levels. And so when we get to a point where we have more seats than we need just for our, uh, our children at certain poverty levels, then we can go to the next level and the next level until we have universal pre-K. So there are some rules about it. Uh, Head Start is a little different. Thank you. So this is a question from a student who's here with us this evening. And it is, is our county doing badly or is it not in good shape? <laughs> yes and no. <laughs> um, no, it, it's, it's a great question. The county is actually poised to do really well. We're going to have, as I said, six uh, between five to six billion dollars worth of development 
going on at one time in the next four years of Prince George's County. No one else will be able to match us in the area doing that. That's the good news. The bad news is that revenue won't come until when my last day in office. <laughs> 2018 or 2020. So we're moving in the right direction. Um, what we aren't doing appropriately and what makes us less competitive is we're not investing in whoever the young person that wrote that uh, question. We're not investing in your education the same way our competitors do in the same way that the people you will be competing against. That's why it's important to see what money we put in compared to our competitors. If they're putting in 60% of their money, if they're Montgomery County or Howard County, that means their money. They're investing in their kids. They're investing in their schools. We haven't done that. So for the last 30 years, we have not invested in the education system the way that our competitors did. They invested more, and they did it consistently for 30 years. We have not. Am I lying, Thomas? Yes. Am I lying, Thomas? Have we invested the same way that our competitors for 30 years? Who believes we have? Oh, yes. I believe Do you believe we have? Mm -hmm. Okay. We have one of the largest school budgets there is. It's not what we're invest that we're not investing, it's the way we are utilizing the money that has been given to us. You don't know, let's hold that question, because that's another question. We're going to hold that one. Investment and utilization are two different things. So let's hold it, because that's a legitimate question about utilization. Investment is black and white. Either the money goes in, it's black and white. It's either we put the money in, or we didn't. You know, that's, it's math. It's not political science, it's math. It's 55% is what we put in, compared to Montgomery County, which puts in 60, I mean, 55% is what the state puts in, we put in 35%. Montgomery County puts in 66%, state puts in 27. These are not my figures, this is what the state gives us, this is math. Howard County puts in 69% of their money, the state puts in 24. Fairfax, 69%, 23. Now that's what we put in, that's the math. How we utilize it, that's another question, that's a legitimate question of whether in fact the money that we're giving to the school system is used appropriately to get the results we need. That's what really this is about. That really is what it's about. <coughs> whether in fact we think the school system, the CEO, the school board, and our students can perform, and are they using the money appropriately to get the results? Or, are, or, or, or is it, as some people believe, throwing good money after bad? That's legitimate. Mm -hmm. That is a legitimate question and a reason why we're holding these debates. Because that, if that, if we, the answer to that question is, the money we've given them isn't showing results, then you're right. Why would you invest more dollars? Now that right there is legitimate, and we should debate that. The amount we put in is math. So for how we're utilizing it, and whether in fact we're getting the best results, and whether in fact more money will move us up to the top, that's another legitimate question. Whether we can move from the bottom to the top 10. That's what I asked them. If I'm gonna go through all this, and put it, put it to the voters, I mean put it to you, and say we're gonna do this, then we've got to know we can move the needle. If not, then we can go back to the 2% we've been giving you. So that's a legitimate question. The math part we got. So we don't invest as much as our competitors. The question is, what are we doing with the money that we are investing? So that's the math. I didn't make that up. That ain't me. That's the state. That's what they gave me. So can we get a question answer? So that's that, what I'm going to turn over to Dr. Maxwell right so, now. So, so a couple of points, and I'm going to ask my, my colleague at the EGCA to, to, to uh, talk from there, too. So, so how, do, how that translates, right, to we're investing plenty and we're not getting the results. So we are investing a lot, but we're not investing as much. So, so here's how it translates out. Uh, there was a report. I think what they want to know is we already know we're not investing the same amount. But the amount that we're investing in, the amount that we gave you last year, 
what, how was it spent, and what did we get out of it to make us believe that if we invest some more in, it's going to be different? That's so, the question. So we have a lot of students who are doing very well in our district, but we don't have enough of our students who are doing well in our district. Um, the, the, the shortfall makes it difficult, as we've been talking all evening, because class sizes are too high, the turnover in our teachers is, is too high. Uh, and, but I would say to you that you know, we can give you the lists of kids who are on honor rolls, we can give you the lists of, of kids who are Gates Millennium Scholars, who are Posse Scholars, uh, but we believe that we could have more of those children. Uh, we, our graduation rate uh, is about 10 points behind the state average. So obviously the kids are not graduating at the same rates as other districts. But last year, with the investment, as, as uh, Mr. Baker has asked, you know, we increased our graduation rate faster than any other district in the state of Maryland. We increased 2.47%. It's the highest rate of growth we've ever had in the district. Uh, and, it, and it is the highest overall graduation rate since they started keeping the uh, cohort graduation rate uh, in the state of Maryland when they changed over from the old lever rate. So when you ask about, you know, can we get there with this investment, if we can uh, take the work that we did last year and expand it across the district and not just, you know, to continue ninth grade promotion rate, for example, as kids go to uh, towards graduation uh, with the literacy coaches that we talked about in secondary schools a little while ago, gifted specialists in elementary school, uh, I feel very confident that 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 growth rate of at least two and a half percent or so is sustainable. And so over five years, I mean, that puts us, you know, above the current rate of the state average, and we think we have enough flexibility built into it to be at or above the state average and certainly above 90%. But, but you can't, you know, you can't handicap a race, you know, and expect that, that your, you know, your, uh, you know, your chosen, you know, candidate in the race is going to be able to catch up you know, from folks that start out way ahead of them. And so it, it's a little bit unfair to say that we should be doing exactly the same as everybody else is doing when we're not given the resources. You know, we're not funding our children. You know, we're, you know, the, the Washington Area Boards of Education latest report says we're $2,500 behind uh, other districts that we compete with. And that makes a difference in class sizes, in, in uh, resources, in digital literacy, in our, all of our tests now. For the park assessments, the new state assessments are on on uh, tablets and, and laptops and things. So our kids have to have exposure to that. Ken, you want to uh, make a couple comments? I, I have to because this is one of our biggest problems here in Prince George's County. It's, it drives me crazy. Uh, this is not the school system that I came to work for in 1987. I've been through the really heavy duty hard years. And what you need to realize is that in the last 10 to 15 years, the teachers union has taken on the issue of teacher performance. And we've been working with management to say, we're going to raise the, the level of performance of all our instructors going forward. And it has worked. Because if you took, there are about 40 locals, there are about 40 education systems in the country that look demographically like we look, okay? Our, I'm in, a, in a, an association called TURN, Teacher Union Reform Network, and my sister county was DeKalb, Georgia, okay? In DeKalb, Georgia, 48% of the children passed the state-mandated tests. In Prince George's County, 78%. We suffer from something called local effect. It's the effect of I'm a, I'm a master's degree, and I walk into a room full of Nobel laureates, and I feel like I should keep quiet. Okay, I'm a little uncomfortable. I'm out of my league. We're in Maryland, the number one state in the country, and by some polls, for education. And we're 23rd out of 24th in Prince George's County, because as we have improved in the last 15 years, incrementally imp improved, Everybody else is improved too. And so what's happened is everybody's gone up and we remain in relation to them, 
But what has happened is that in Prince George's County, 78% of our kids are passing the tests. And that's unheard of in a two-thirds poverty school system. And I travel the country, and I, I visit other locals, and, I, and the secretary, none other than Arnie Duncan, refers to us as the Prince George's miracle. Are we a perfect school system? No. Have we, have we pushed people to their limits to improve performance? Yes. We may be at about the point the maximum return we can get on the dollars that we invest. Because All of that sounds good. We're, good, we're driving out. Question. We're driving. I'm telling you that we are an improving school system. That we have accomplished great strides in the last decade yeah. and a half, but, and that we need to take that next step without driving professionals out of the classroom in six years, which is what we're doing. Fifty percent lead. You're not answering the question. Thank, thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, but I do want to know for our student, did that answer your question? Did, did, did we answer your question? No, you didn't. Okay. Dr. Maxwell, will you be fully funding the new specialty programs such as language immersion, international baccalaureate, middle years programs so that they are fully functioning programs soon? So those expansions are included in this budget as well in next year of the, so we started kindergarten and three new Spanish versions, for example, and first grade is in this uh, budget request. Uh, the additional uh, rollouts of international baccalaureate to support the high school programs that we have uh, are in the rollout as we planned it. It's not 100% of the schools that we'll ultimately have, it's the, one that we, the ones that we planned for in our you know, sort of successive uh, plan uh, are in there. Uh, the additional seats for uh, gifted uh, programs for Montessori, French immersion, all those kinds of things are all in the budget. Uh, but will I fund it depends on whether the budget gets funded. Thank you. Um, what is available for parents who attempt to work with the school toward the su success of their child when the school staff fails to cooperate? So, so we've been, you know, we've been working on. Uh, customer service part of, of all of that work. And, and I would say that, first of all, we've been expanding parent advocates, people who are assigned to work with schools and, and reach out to parents and, and support parents in that work. Um, but I would also say that if you're running across an, an obstacle where you want to work with a school and you're having that trouble, uh, I think, is Christian, Christian, are you in the room? Christian Rose, were you in the room? Christian's outside. Oh. So, so you can email that concern to my office at CEO at pcps.org, or if anybody has a, a question about a school you're, you're struggling to access or whatever, Chris, Christian Rhodes, uh, who, who works with me, uh, has some business cards there, and, and uh, you can give him a call, and, and he'll, he'll work with you to get the access that, that you're looking for. Thank you. Where do the funds go for students enrolled at a public charter school? What is preventing the use of those funds to support important academic enrichment programs such as band, choir, and sports? So, so, uh, so charter schools are public schools under the law. They're funded uh, at a formula determined by the state. It's a, there's a little bit of a withhold because we do the hiring, we do the paychecks, we do those things, but they get a certain percentage of per pupil funding that every other uh, student gets to fund their schools. They make decisions about how they allocate those funds. And for many of the small uh, charter schools, and again, when you talk about athletics, you know, some of them are in middle school, some of them are just in elementary schools. Uh, none of them are really in high school right now here in Prince George's County. But, uh, but again, they have choices about how they spend that money. But I don't, I think most of them are making decisions. I mean, a lot of them don't even provide transportation uh, for children to their schools um, at, at the charter schools. But they have some level of autonomy. Uh, but but they once they go to that school, there are children in that school. So whatever resources that school offers them are there. Once they're enrolled in that school, they're not eligible to participate in sports at what would have been their home school, I think, because they've transferred to another school. Is it true that most of the money in the county budget goes to the high schools? If so, why is that? It's, 
it's not true. Um, I mean, you have to look at the enrollment of our school system and say that you know we have you know, 128,000 kids, we have 200 or some schools, and so the money is actually allocated by child, by student in the school. And so, you know, we have some really big high schools, we have some really small high schools, right? We have some very large elementary schools. I mean, I, I, was, I was really surprised last year when I got here and found elementary schools with 1,000 kids or more. Uh, but, uh, but, it, but you're funded based on your student enrollment and the grade level uh, that you're in. And so high schools have more teachers, they have more kids, they have more, you know, they have you know, athletic things and all that. But, but the money, the, the educational money, the instructional money follows a child. Uh, and again, there's a little bit of difference in the formula from elementary, middle, and high school, but, uh, but pretty much the funding follows the kids. So uh, Central High School gets less than Eleanor Roosevelt or Bowie High School or Oxon Hill, for example, because of, of their size. Sports go the same way. Um, Mary Harris, mother of Jones, <laughs> uh, gets uh, uh, a lot more than Tulip Grove and Bowie because of the number of kids that they have. So it's all formula driven, and that formula takes into account a number of factors, so it's not exactly a one to one. It's not everybody gets exactly this dollar amount. So hot kids, kids who are free reduced meals, they get a little bit more from the formula than others. And so, uh, but, but pretty much the money is. is uh, by, by child and then aggregated by the number of children in that school. Thank you. Will this proposed increase help the school lunch program? And, and if so, how? The income guidelines are unreasonable and do not take into consideration that, you, that your take home pay is different from your gross and that it um, also does not account for expenses such as rent, utilities, etc. So, so part of the answer is the federal government controls the guidelines which make you eligible for free and reduced meals. I don't. So I, I can't make a different standard than the federal government requires for, for inclusion. And they reimburse us and they don't reimburse us for the full cost of those, uh, those meals. So that's part one of, of the answer. The second part of the answer is there is money in the budget to improve the breakfast program because we – uh, when I got here last year and we looked at the, uh, that part of the data, uh, it was clear that we weren't even feeding 70% of the eligible children breakfast who were coming to school. And uh, it's very clear that there's a connection uh, between health and nutrition and performance in school. And it's pretty hard for a, a child to be focused on social studies or language arts or, or math or science or music or art uh, halfway through the morning if they haven't had breakfast because all they're really thinking about is lunch and then they're going to get their next meal. And it depends partly on the, the dinner they had or didn't have the night before. So uh, there's a, a three-year expansion of the breakfast program moving towards universal breakfast programs so that you don't have that stigma of, you know, I'm, on, I'm the only ones that are eating or the ones on free and reduced meals. So it'll kind of open that up and allow more kids. We opened uh, five more uh, Maryland Meals for Achievement Schools the day after spring break. We came back after spring break. We've been expanding those programs <laughs> since I got here. Uh, you know, some, somebody mentioned that for all the poverty uh, that we see and that we talk about, the reality is Maryland as a whole is one of the wealthier uh, states in the country. And, and from my seat, it is uh, a shame uh, that, that in one of the wealthiest states in the wealthiest country in the world, we have hungry children coming to school. And so uh, I've been doing a lot of work for a decade or so now uh, on this childhood hunger issue. And we are going to continue to work to make sure that we're feeding the children uh, who are our charge. Thank you. Before we go on with the next questions, I just want it's getting to be almost 8 o'clock. Um, but we have a lot, of, a lot of questions remaining. And it's our intention to keep going, um, answering the questions on the card. And then if it's not too, too, too late, we may take two or three questions from the floor. So um, if everybody's good for it, we're, we're, we're rolling. So we'll take the next question. <laughs> Some people may want to get home for dinner, but um, we want to keep, keep this conversation going. Uh, here's the next question. <laughs> Neighboring counties offer kids on-campus programs to focus academic enrichment in the basic R's, reading, writing, and arithmetic. 
Is this something feasible and affordable for Prince George's County to establish at the community college? Okay. Neighboring counties offer students on, on campus programs to foster academic enrichment in the three basics, reading, writing, and arithmetic. Is this something feasible and affordable for Prince George's County to establish at the community college? So, uh, I, I'd have to uh, get a little more information maybe on what, what that program is. We do a lot of work with uh, the community college, and, and we have students who are dually enrolled. It's called dual enrollment, and we pay for that. It's a huge bargain for, for parents. If anybody has uh, high school age uh, children, particularly ones that are going to go into the 11th and 12th grade, uh, there's a, a grade uh, GPA requirement, a grade point average requirement. Uh, but if they are, if they meet the requirements of the program and have the recommendation of the principal, they can attend uh, a community college uh, in, in a uh, approved uh, program and, and get the college credits before they graduate from high school and the school system pays for it. We have a memorandum of understanding signed with the community college, Prince George County Community College. Uh, we are about to, uh, to sign one with uh, Bowie State University sometime in the next few weeks should be able to do that by uh, next fall. We have programs there like the Academy for Health Sciences, which has a huge waiting list for applications, which is actually a four-year high school program uh, at the community college. And uh, at, a, at a day a few weeks down the road from now, those children are going to graduate uh, with a high school diploma from Prince George's County in the morning, and then they're going to go back to the community college and receive their Associates of Arts degree uh, from the community college that evening. Uh, so again, you know, when people talk about the success, remember we have lots of, of examples of success. What we're trying to do is bring the level up for, for more and more of our, of our children. Um, I have a great relationship with the president of community college. If there are other program opportunities, but we focus a lot on the reading, writing, uh, arithmetic, as, as the saying goes, you know, that starts with an A, but um, the, the uh, and, and a W for writing, but, but um, but I, I think that, you know, certainly Dr. Dukes is open to other opportunities and, and I am as, as well. Uh, we, we explore a lot of uh, different opportunities and I think that, you know, we'll, we'll continue to work on the dual enrollment program as well. And we're also talking about some, uh, some uh, uh, supports for uh, the community college inside of our schools to work with our kids to, to make sure that they're able to access uh, the community college dual enrollment and things like that. So, how many people on the panel have children in Prince George's County Public Schools? And how many people have had children enrolled in Prince George's County Public Schools? So, so I graduated from Bladensburg High School. Uh, I went to two other schools in this district that, that uh, aren't here anymore. One of them is a community center and the other one is being used for another purpose now. Uh, but I graduated from Bladensburg High School that, that still exists. Uh, and uh, I just, uh, you know, I, I worked for a long time here before going on some travels around the state. I uh, spent 22 and a half years of, of my career here. I student taught at High Point High School. I taught at Crossland High School as assistant principal at Central High School, principal at Buck Lodge Middle School, principal at Northwestern High School. Went to Montgomery, went to, Prince, uh, went to uh, Anne Arundel, and I'm back home in my hometown. I lived here that whole time. My wife just retired. Uh, about 20 months ago, at the same time I came here, she retired after 36 years of teaching in the district. Two of my four children graduated uh, from, high, from high school in, in Prince George County. The other two graduated from public schools in a neighboring uh, jurisdiction where my ex-wife moved after, you know, things happened. And, and uh, that's another story when the cameras aren't right. Um, so, so uh, but, but I know, uh, I, I can speak for Dr. Thorne because his children went to Central High School where, where I was assistant principal. And uh, uh, you have a, a great father uh, sitting here, and uh, he had great, great daughters who, who I know are doing very, very well. And this I, gives me a chance to, to, to make a comment about uh, that. Um, my daughters did attend uh, the Central High School when uh, our CEO was, uh, was there on the staff. Um, we had many more people uh, in the county then who attached themselves to public education. Uh, One's identity, one's economic identity, one's middle class concept was an extension of public education. 
that identity is now no longer as associated with public education. And the struggle that we're trying to accomplish here in the leadership of our county executive and others is to return that identity. If you only, if you have less than 30%, probably a quarter, a quarter of your households with any association with public education, that's not a winning scenario. So what we're talking about is stabilization. So when the county executive talks about the development concepts, investment in public education by people like me. So when my children were at Central High School, my wife and I were invested in public education. Now that I'm an old man, and still living in Prince George's County, income has gone up. Am I still invested in public education? This is what the county executive is trying to get us to understand. It, he has to deal with the numbers, but in a broad sense, I'm a typical case of what he has to get help from. Central person in 1980, attached, public education, excited, great programs, people standing it overnight in, in body bags, not body bags, but in, in overnight bags, trying to get into public schools, international baccalaureate program, excited, right? All of a sudden, I'm now an old man, and um, this is not me, but this is what's happening. We have to stop it. Not attached to public schools. So we build large homes, like the one I live in, right? And we expect the people who buy those homes to not be attached to public education, to be attached to anything but public education. You can't run a competitive county. So dealing with what the county executive is asking us to do, you must deal with this that I'm describing, which means people like me sharing wealth with our children, even though I don't have children in schools anymore, my grandchildren are here, you have to convince me that it's in my best interest to share wealth with our children because my housing value, the quality of my life, my identity as a person, that's the bottom line. And we have to be willing to do that. People like me must be willing to do that. That's what this discussion is largely on. And the other thing, when my colleague said two thirds of the kids now, limited, uh, Needy students, needy students in perpetual motion. So when we talk about educating our kids, it's not a stable group of kids. It's kids in perpetually moving. So when the county exec is working hard to try to stabilize communities where these babies live, so you don't have kids moving from one school to another school. We know what's happening in the region, right? Kids moving around everywhere. This is why what we're trying to do here in the largest sense, development as well as stabilization of public education and reattachment of people like me to public education must be done. And I think this is, this is certainly why I, I associate myself with it, because I'm, I'm the prototypical person who must attach myself to public education and share my resources with our children. I'm the prototype. As for me, and I like the sign up here, and it's right, we are one. That, that really is, we're all in this. So my baby, all three of my children went through our public school system. They all graduated from Suitland High School. My baby graduated in 2012 uh, from Suitland High School. Um, so we've gone through, and we've seen the best and the worst. The baby had a great education here. She went to TAG, Judith Boyer, early Montessori school. Uh, really gifted and very smart, she was in that program. From there, she went to Heather Hills, where she you know, was with 20 kids that stayed together through sixth grade. By the time she graduated from Heather Hills, she was done. She can go anywhere. I had a middle child, same household, both parents lawyers, treated all our children the same, who had one of the worst experiences you could ever have in Prince George's County public school system. Not a really good experience, first grade teacher with a child that had, uh, was a slow learner. Uh, she struggled. Um, we worked with her. My solution, like a lot of parents who have options, was I'm pulling my child out and sending her to private school where she can get the attention. My wife's solution was, because I was a delegate at the time, Dr. Thorpe, <laughs> remember that? Yes, sir. So I was calling people up. I was trying to call favors. I ain't gonna lie to you. I just cared about my child. My wife's was, no, we're gonna leave her here. We're gonna go to the school system and we're gonna demand 
that they actually do their job and we're going to participate. Now, I walked in there as Delegate Baker, right, Dr. Gorman? Yes, sir. And I said, hi, I'm Delegate Baker. That's my child. They said, great, Delegate Baker. We're going to tell you this is what we're going to do. We're going to be a reader, reading specialist. We're going to get her a great teacher. We're going to do all of these things for your child. I said, terrific. Because I want my baby to, you know, explore the world. I want her to be everything. My wife said, nope. There were seven other kids who had the same first grade teacher, the same second grade teacher, the same third grade teacher. Everything you're doing for this child, you must do for those other children. Now, nobody was volunteering that stuff back then because that's money. The reason I bring that up is what she understood back then, and as my wife did, and what I didn't understand until I got older, is the children who sit next to your children influence their thinking. But also, the school system that sits next to your house determines how much your house is worth. If we wanted that property we bought in Chevrolet to go up in value, it was our responsibility to make sure that the school system was better and that every step of the way that's why it's important for us to invest. Yes, we have our children that went through the school system. Thomas children went through the school We're in the school system. You know, we're vested. Thank you. Prince George's County has changed greatly demographically from 1970 to 1985. The county is now poised for a similar demographic shift. How are present and future education spending preparing and accounting for this change? Great question. Whoever wrote that, that's a great question. So I know Dr. Thornton, uh, this is his area of, uh, of uh, study. Uh, you know, demographic changes come, but, but children, from my viewpoint, uh, are, are all uh, the same. You know, we, we talk about, uh, you know, we have more poverty now, but we know how to teach children poverty. But it costs more to educate them than, than a child who's not in poverty. We know that too. And so that's part of the, part of the issue uh, that, that we have. Uh, if, if I understand this, the uh, uh, second uh, demographic shift might be a second language learners and, and uh, the international population that's growing. Perhaps uh, the writer of the question meant something different, but uh, but if that's the trend, we are seeing uh, some growth in, in second language learners. But you know, it's interesting in, in America that we we uh, treat uh, children who, who who have a different first language like they have some sort of impediment to learning, which just isn't true. Uh, I did a Fulbright Principal Exchange to, to Brazil and visited some of the poorest schools in the world, uh, public schools. And yet I never met uh, a child in any of those schools who didn't speak their own uh, Brazilian Portuguese and passable English. Every child learns other languages in most other countries. Only here do we consider it as something that's for gifted children only. You know, it's some kind of mindset that we have. You know, when you go to the European Union and you go to countries in, in Europe, they have a, a European Union uh, uh, language requirement. You learn your country's uh, native language with, with, with fluency, obviously, and you learn a second language with fluency, and you learn a third one with some level of proficiency. That's their standard. In, in the United States, we have no national language policy, and in Maryland, it takes two years of a foreign language uh, to, to be eligible for a Maryland diploma when we know it takes five to seven years uh, to become fluent in, in another language. Uh, I happen to have done my dissertation in two-way immersion in English and Spanish, and uh, I have done a lot of work with language learners, and I had folks from the center, uh, the, she's now the president emeritus, but the president at the time of the Center for Applied Linguistics on my dissertation committee. I mean, I, uh, it, it's a field I know a little bit about, and, and um, you know, our, our children, uh, those, the, the children that we have, all of our children, whether they're poor children whose first language is English or, or uh, children who, who speak uh, their first language is French or Spanish or, 
Urdu or, or whatever. We have kids from, from all around the world who are, who are coming here. Uh, they're, they're all able to learn. Now, it means we need, need more ELL uh, programming. We need more opportunities uh, for kids to acclimate to, to our culture and to, to our language. Uh, but we need to do a lot more, and that's what our, because we have English-speaking parents who want their kids in Spanish immersion and French immersion. We have one of the oldest French immersion programs in the United States of America here, a resource, a wealth in Prince George's County, right? Uh, and, and what we need to do is, is look at it a little differently than I think we traditionally look at it. But we're, we're funding programs to, to work with all of the children that we have, whether they're special needs kids, whether they are um, you know, high poverty kids, whether they're gifted kids, we're providing programs for all of them. We'll continue to just, as we build our annual budgets, appropriate the right amount of money to the particular classes that we need from year to year. Dr. Thorne. Over the, over the past uh, at least three decades, you've seen um, a phenomenon emerge uh, that I think the leadership of the county, uh, this one as well as well as previous ones, tried to uh, keep from uh, becoming institutionalized. <coughs> that is, a particular role assigned to Prince George's County uh, that is different from a role assigned to other neighboring counties. And that is to house, to educate, uh, demographically different populations without adequate resources. <laughs> you just have to fight against that. You have to stop it, right? Because one of the things that Prince George's County has done historically for the state of Maryland, it has disproportionately taken care of students that are the most needed. That's a heavy responsibility. And it is now asked to take care of the most diverse population in the state of Maryland. Now my position is, this is not the county executive, this is me, so I don't want to associate it with it. My position is that when it comes to the education of our children, they are citizens of Maryland. They're not citizens of Prince George's County or Montgomery County or Howard County. They're citizens of Maryland. They are not citizens of a zip code. They are not citizens of a community, a gated or ungated. They are citizens of Maryland. Now, when we approach this issue, we have to start from that, that they have a constitutional right to equal, highly funded, equitable education, no matter where they live. And I say that politically, we do not have the right to deny a child adequate education because of where they live. Amen. To whom they were born, their level of income of their daddy, or their immigrant status, or whatever. Now, philosophically, we must accept that and start from that. So what we will do if we do that, we will support initiatives that raises resources from people like me and others, but we will also say to the state and to the federal government, right, that we want constitutionally required resources for our children. Now, if the citizenry is not motivated by this, in mind, if you're not motivated by that basic precept that I just articulated, you won't fight for your children. You, people like, you won't demand that people like me share wealth with the children, and I live in the county and benefit from the resources for the county. You must be driven by that. Because this county, if you go to Northern County, you know demographically what's happening there, right? Your Bladenburg is different than it was in the old days. My central is very different, right? So, and that requires us to be what? To be united around the children as a basic right when it comes to education. I think what's being proposed here is a part of that stool. Getting the money from the state, the $20 million, is another part of the stool. And as I started out with my comments, the leadership consensus about the importance of education, public education, that's a good important distinction, public education. Charters and others can augment, they can be auxiliary, they can be add-ons, but no school system starts out with as high quality, starts out with what? As the center of their educational initiative, they don't start out with charters and private schools and parochial schools, they start out with what? Public schools. And that's what Prince George's County is. What have been identified as problems with the quality of staff in our schools and what is being done as a solution to that challenge? So we've already uh, you know, kind of talked about some of that a little bit. Um, some of the issues have to do with the turnover. I mean, we know from national research uh, that 
uh, we tend to have a lot of higher turnover in higher poverty schools, and that turnover, that constant turnover, uh, creates um, not the same level of opportunity, I guess, because the teachers don't have the same level of expertise. So, so there are, are several, and I've talked about the 7,100 you know, teachers that we've replaced since 2007, 2008 school year. So we are, we are, you know, again, you know, working on our, our recruitment efforts, and we, in our, um, you know, since I've been here, you know, we've worked to to try to as adequately as possible uh, improve uh, compensation. Part of that is in this budget, so that we can hopefully retain more of the teachers that we recruit and bring in here. But we also added mentor teachers, and in collaboration uh, with the teachers association. Uh, we started a program called Peer Assistance and Review, which is a collaborative uh, relationship between the Teachers Association and, and um, our, our school administration to, to work together to support teachers, and if that support doesn't work, then to you know, remove them from the exit, then that's a nice way of saying it, uh, uh, from, from the profession if they're not you know, able to adequately uh, perform. I think we've met a dozen teachers that have have left after going through uh, the PAR program uh, this year. Um, but I think that, that uh, the mentor teachers and the peer assistants and, and review teachers are really important to help our you know, new teachers. I mean, we hired 900 and some teachers last year and they need uh, support. You know, they're coming to us because we've always been an important state. We don't produce in our institutions of higher education here enough teachers to replace the ones that are retiring and moving and leaving the profession and going to other districts. So, so we need to bring teachers here from other states, uh, and in some cases other countries, uh, to teach our children. And, and they need you know, the support uh, when they get here to be able, whether they're coming from Pennsylvania or Florida, North Carolina or, or, or Georgia, New York, uh, or you know, Spain, France, you know, we have some of our language teachers that are coming from, uh, from other countries. So, uh, so I think you know, that, that's, that's some of the issues with our staff. I will say we have a new teacher evaluation that I know uh, my colleague Ken, Ken Haynes uh, you know, mentioned, uh, the new evaluation system and things. And, and uh, like other districts across the country, other states across the country, you know, we have new requirements that focus uh, part of that evaluation on student data and part of it on the way you teach. And uh, that, that new system we've been, you know, working to implement. We have an approved uh, plan from the state of Maryland. And, uh, you know, it's a lot more structured way. When I re returned here last year, um, they, were, they were using the same evaluation form when I got here. And that changed in the weeks following my arrival because the plan was approved and we got the new forms done. But they had been evaluating teachers in Prince George's County with the same forms that they were using from the 1970s when I arrived. And yet the teaching profession has changed so much. And so it was time for a new evaluation system. Thank you, Dr. Maxwell. Um, for Mr. Baker, um, to improve the desire for folk to move to Prince George's County, I feel we need to improve the infrastructure, roads, traffic, trash cleanup. What is planned for those items? Thank you. On the um, and, and I agree. I mean, we have to do it all. Um, so we're investing in the infrastructure. And in fact, the dollars we got from the state, especially around our um, major thoroughfares in Prince George's County, which a lot of those are state roads, which they're not giving us money for. So a lot of when people look at these uh, highways, we're actually having to use county resources for them. But we are putting our money into areas to help grow our commercial tax base. So infrastructure dollars that we put together in, in the county in a budget I think we put how much how much in that do you remember? For public works and the roads we, we spend about 40 to 50 million dollars a year to do roads various types of road uh, improvements throughout the county. How are these promises of improvements for the schools different from Iris Metz promises to make earlier county schools in the top few of the state. Excellent question. We hope that Dr. Maxwell will tell us exactly how this proposal is different from the proposal that Dr. Metz uh, said a few years ago. 
So I'm not sure that I'm really the best one to answer that question because the reason I went on my little sojourn around the state was because of the tenure of Iris Metz. Um, what, what Iris Metz did was drive a lot of very experienced, capable people out of Prince George's County. Um, and I, you know, uh, you may or may not agree, you know, but I believe I was a pretty competent, capable uh, principal. And, I, let, me, let me just say, I, I think to get to the question, I think what they don't really care about, Dr. Yeah. they really care about what the program is different from. So we've been, so we've been very, so we've been very clear uh, in what the elements of our strategic plan are, uh, and we are trying to drive resources to our individual schools and provide support for our teachers. I'd say that's uh, kind of the sum along with some digital literacy. Uh, I don't, I don't know that it was as clear uh, in those years. Uh, and I and I think that you know again we've been working you know to to recruit, retain, support our teachers, and we put in a very structured academic improvement. Our, our schools haven't really usually had a very structured strategic plan. We brought in experts uh, from around the, the state and the country last year to uh, provide us with some information as a transition team, and did, did uh, internal and external stakeholder surveys went through a long uh, process to build this strategic plan to meet the needs of our children. And uh, we believe that the plan uh, has, has received pretty great reviews uh, by and large across our, our district and from some experts around the country. And the funding plan that supports it uh, is, is raising some eyebrows, I think, but it's absolutely fundamentally necessary to accomplish the work. Let, let me also say that as a, as a former uh, three-term chairman of the school board, uh, I've been through the rough spots, right? One of the things that's also critical here is stabilized leadership with broad political consensus around it. Now, we all went through, and I was a part of it, right? We all went through periods where, for whatever reason, whoever good, whoever bad, we just had differences. And we had differences. Now, without going back to that, we need to build upon the broad consensus politically about the importance of our schools, people being united around that from the General Assembly, the county executive, the CEO, and buying, get buying from the public. Now, historically, we've not had that. Now we have an opportunity for that. No, no plan will work if you don't have that. Because politically, people will be over here and over there, and people will caricature the newspaper, and you have war fighting, county executive, all of that. No school system can survive like that. So I, I look forward to building upon consensus about the importance and integrated collaborative leadership on behalf of children. And that doesn't mean it's going to be perfect, you're going to have some differences, but some of the artificial fights that we had, and I participated in some of them, <laughs> the systems don't survive like that. The ones that we're comparing ourselves to, notice the difference. So let's build on this. We can have differences about North County, but let's make sure that we are protective of our public school system and political leadership is unified around it. Thank you. Why are we focusing on raising taxes instead of focusing on activities that will raise property values, which will raise revenue? If you want to raise property values, you have to have a quality school system. There's only two ways we're going to raise revenues in the county, legally. I got any other options. The state won't give it to me. I can't bring money. It's commercial tax base and residential tax base. Our money comes 70% from residential property taxes, 30% or so from commercial. We're doing everything in our power to grow the commercial tax base. We're begging, pleading, you know, asking people to come here. Dave and Busters, I chased them around the world to get here so we can expand the number of jobs in that commercial tax base. But it's hard as heck to get anybody to invest in a place when they say, okay, what is your reputation? Well, gosh, if I have a choice to put a new company in Prince George's County, great office space, right next to the District of Columbia, and I'm competing against Arlington, in Fairfax, in Montgomery, same space, guess where they're going? Even with incentives. We got an EDI fund, $50 million, that we incentivize for businesses to come here. It's coming, but without 
a quality school system, you're not going to see your values rise. But are higher taxes going to chase them away as well? Yeah, mm -hmm. I'm, going to get, I'm going to get to that. So the question was, does higher taxes chase them away? Businesses? Mm -hmm. No. Residents? No. Anyone. Uh, anybody. So the higher taxes, when, yes, I mean, people are going to look at how much you pay in taxes and say, okay, do I make a choice between paying more and sending my kids to private school or going to Montgomery County and having that option? The only way we're going to be competitive is to have a school system that invests in there so people have the option of coming here. The only way we're going to be competitive, the only way we're going to get our property values up is to have a first-rate school system. That's Sir, it. if you have a school system, and oh, oh, but just let me finish. Just let me please let me finish this one question. The question was, you were saying that you've got to have a, this a, to have better property values. You have to have better schools. But if you have higher taxes and you have another jurisdiction that has the comparable school system but lower taxes, you're still in the same boat. Yeah, but here's here's what happened. It's the property value. So you're going with the tax. If we had. If the value of our homes were higher, you would lower the property uh, taxes. Give you an example. The guy in Anne Arundel County is saying that, because we're raising our property taxes, he's actually lowering his. The reason he can lower, he's not lowering the investment in school system. He's still investing 66%. But because the assessed values are higher, he can actually invest more. If we can move ours up, we can do the same thing. But we have to get it up there. That's the only way. But you've got 20 systems whoa, 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 with lower tax rates. We're going to have to go there. We're going to have to do more. We're going to have to do more. Wait a minute. Let me just say this. Let me say this. Hold it. Let me just say this. Let me just say this. Let me say this. Wait, 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 ma'am. Wait. I promise you. Let them read through the question. I will stay here all night. You've had my go. question for 40 minutes, Hold it. and no, it has wait. not been read. But I said, as soon as they finish reading through the questions, I will stay here, and you and I can go back and forth. No, I'll but stay this needs to be tomorrow. public, because see, it this can't is be what we do. You know what? Wait, wait, wait. Wait, wait. There's no reason for that. Hold it. Let, because I want the people's questions. Let them read through the questions, and then we can stay and we can debate. But that's an important question for everybody. No, I just answered it. We will all stay and wait. That's right. Let them leave through the questions. We, we are going, we're going through the questions one by one. If your question's here, we're going to get to it. And we'll make our answers short so we can stay and go back. Why is there so much attention given for what students eat rather than on classroom activity? Is it possible to spend less on healthier options in the cafeteria and more on new textbooks and innovative tools that can be used to help students excel in the classroom? No. They're both important. Okay, next question. How can you make it possible for the kids to bring their textbooks home? So I think in some situations they can bring them home, and in some they only have classroom sets because of the uh, inadequate funding that we have. So the only way to give every child a textbook to take back and forth and go away from classroom sets of things is to invest appropriately in our public school system. Will summer school only be open for high school students? We've had some summer uh, programs, second grade reading, for example, last year. We have some other specific programs, but we don't have the level of funding that we need to offer a summer school program for every child at every grade level. The reason it focuses on high school is because of the credit requirement for graduation. So when you're in elementary school and, and you want to do some enrichment work or, or you need some, uh, some work on reading, uh, while that's an important need and we give summer packets and those kind of things for, for parents to work with their children, you can't graduate kids if they don't earn the credits in high school. And so the focus on summer school uh, is related to the Carnegie units and the earning of credits in high school. Thank you. You compared our monetary input into the school system with other counties that don't have the Maryland National Capital Park and Planning Tax like us. Yes, Montgomery County has it, but they are an extremely rich county. 
with many mansions, and you cannot compare us with them. Why don't you lower that budget and apply it into the school system? One, we, we uh, asked park and planning, and we sent it to the council. We didn't want them to raise their taxes. The other is um, we can't actually take money from park and planning uh, to put it toward the school. So the amount that we can, am I right, Thomas? Right, state law restricts their money for, 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 for specific uses. Is the county executive willing to compromise on a lower, more gradual tax rate proposal phased in over three years? That's a great, that is a great question. Um, no, this amount, the 15 cents, is actually phased in on the uh, portions that are coming in over the years. But in order for us to move the school system up, what I've asked Dr. Maxwell to give us is the budget that moves us from where we are, investing in the county, to move us in the top 10. Uh, we have been doing you know, 2% or percent, whatever we could find. But in order for us to catch up with our competitors, we really need to have that money in there that we use over the period of time. This is a one-time shot. This is it. We don't get to raise it anymore. The shot you got. So um, I proposed to the count uh, to the council not a proposal that would get us from 23 to 21 or 20 23 to 20, but would move us into top 10. And I think that's what we're having a discussion about whether in fact the proposal will do that. If it does that, we'll raise the value. So can Prince George's County adopt a Clean Hands Act? similar to a policy the District of Columbia had for social workers to ensure commitment to the improvement of the city because of their employment by the D.C. government. This could help ensure all employees who reside in another county but work here are equally committed and responsible for contribution to sustaining livable communities in Prince George's County. Or can these employees be taxed to support such an effort? I'm, I'm not familiar. I'm not familiar with that, but uh, we can take that and look at it and get an answer on the website. Uh, for the testing, that this is for Dr. Maxwell. For the testing that's being done, uh, some parts of these tests are being given to our kids but yet the children did not learn the subject matter. So, um, you know, again, I think with the supervision of schools, you know, our, our expectation, our hope is that our teachers are covering all of the material uh, that is there for the test. Uh, I think that partly the results of the test will tell us uh, whether or not that's true or not. I do know that at times there are issues with getting through all of the material. And I know this year, for example, we had pretty significant weather impact on our, our school year. And I know even with advanced placement teachers, they're like, you know, we really lost a lot of instructional time to get our kids ready for those tests. But we do have pacing guides. We do have, you know, the curriculum spelled out. We do have expectations. And I think that, you know, working with, you know, our, our uh, principals as well as our teachers to work on making sure that we're covering the material in the specified amount of time. And we've been working with the Wallace Foundation with our principals and assistant principals and our principal supervisors to make sure that we're all coordinated on that level of work, uh, that we will improve that. I think the other issue that impacts it, and I, and I don't want to be too long, I know, because we have some other questions, is that uh, <coughs> the amount of testing that we're doing has been raising a, a question for all of us, for parents, for students, for, for us. And so we've created a work group, uh, about 40 people, teachers and others, uh, to look at whether or not we can consolidate some of what we're doing so that maybe, you know, the benchmark testings and things can be consolidated with uh, unit tests and all. So we have people looking at every single test that we give uh, in the school district. And it's not a small task we're going to do. It's not a couple week kind of project. Uh, but we hope to get some really decent recommendations out of that that will help us actually add instructional days and drop some of the testing. Does the school district have any programs to explore public-private partnerships similar to stormwater management? Similar to stormwater management? Yeah. That's what the question is. Oh, oh. So, so, I mean, we have, 
I don't know if they, they qualify for the exact uh, thing, but you know we have a lot of business partnerships where we work with people with our high school academies. I have a business advisory group that I, I met with just this morning. Um, we have a number of relationships with professional organizations, the Panasonic Foundation, the Wallace Foundation. Uh, we have in the past had some, some work off and on with the Gates Foundation, but um, we also have some, some work where, uh, again, like we, we have an environmental steering Environmental Education Steering Committee, which includes partners from business and the, and the nonprofit sector. If I can just add real quick, the, 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 we are working with the state and the um, state officials and other school systems and county governments to try to figure out a way to bring the private sector in as far as help renovating schools or building new schools. It's something we've been studying for a couple of years, trying to figure out a model that will you know, work for both sides, and, and so that is underway as well on the, on the construction construction side. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, Tom. Uh, we often hear the negatives of our school system in the media. What is being done to promote the success of our students, teachers, and administrators for residents to be supportive of this request to increase taxes? You know, first of all, I'd, I'd say uh, we've been out almost every night trying to talk to people all across the district about the work that we're engaged in, the work that we're doing. Uh, we've reorganized our, our public information work. Uh, we have uh, folks who have redone our website. You know, they're, they're, they're working very diligently. There's a lot of information on our website. Um, but I think that, you know, again, I think partly it's that relationship with the media and really trying to get them to pick up some of that information. I mean, we can put out a press release that says that we have, you know, seven more posse scholars or three more Gates Millennium Scholars, but if the media doesn't cover that, I can't do much more beyond that besides my own website and making sure that we're doing that sort of internal and community. Uh, the last, last point, I guess, is that in terms of, you know, the strategic plan, it is our, our, uh, uh, our it's in our, our plan uh, to make sure that we are reporting publicly about each one of the strands of that strategic plan in an annual report at the, at the end of each of those uh, annual reporting periods. I've been a Prince George's County resident for almost 50 years. My children received a good education in its schools, and I taught in Prince George's schools for 25 years. Through the years, I have not seen any money solve the problems that keep the schools from improving significantly. And those are student attitude and lack of parent participation. How can these be addressed with the extra money? So I've already mentioned uh, the parent advocates uh, that we're uh, putting out into schools. We have another uh, significant number of them. We began rolling out. We also reorganized. Uh, we didn't really have a, a function or a structure in central office when I got here last year toward parent uh, and community training and outreach. And so working with the board, uh, we established a, a parent and community outreach part of our organization. And we took someone out of our Comer office to, to head that office up. And their responsibility is to provide uh, training opportunities for PTAs and, and countywide uh, for people across the district. Still a pretty small office, but we were planning on, on expanding that a little bit. And then some additional schools will receive parent advocates to work with the, the parents in those particular schools. Uh, so that, that's the parent part. In terms of the student part, uh, we reorganized our, our office uh, related to student services. And we are um, you know, really working diligently. We've changed our, our discipline code in the last year. And we have um, a project. Uh, doing some collaborative work again with the Teacher Association on restorative justice and trying to, to move away from such a punitive uh, way to, to really trying to teach kids about how uh, their, their conduct is affecting their educational outcome and how to change that. In addition, I can add that we have our uh, Department of Social Work that's also working with the social services that working with 28 of the schools in the, uh, especially in the transforming neighborhoods area and our health department that's coming in in those areas. You have indicated that one of the reasons that there isn't enough tax revenue to fund education is, the, is that the county's commercial tax base is smaller than other jurisdictions. I think you've talked about this before. 
What have you done previously to increase this base? And what are you doing now? Why haven't you been more successful? <laughs> that's a good question. Um, we, <laughs> that's why we came up with our EDI fund to attract businesses here. We're now starting to see some of those come online. We've got MGM that's coming. We've got a $650 million uh, regional medical center that's coming on online. We've got the new uh, DHCD that's coming to New Carrollton. Um, we've got development that's going around the county. It's coming. The problem is the money is not here. So we are expanding it. We want to do more of it. We want to be able to get the FBI, which is a $2 billion uh, development that would come here. It would make it easier if I could tell them that they're coming to an area with a great education system. It would make it a lot easier. So we're doing all of those things, but we need your help with this important uh, part of it. If property taxes of houses go uh, to schools, how do you collect from apartment dwellers so that they pay their fair share? The way we've structured this proposal is to, to not overly burden one, one component. So residential owners like myself are going to pay part of it. The 15 cents also picks up commercial. So if I, if I own an office building, I'm paying the 15 cents as an as a, as a owner of that building. If I'm an apartment building, I'm also paying the 15 cents as, as part of that, and, and the renters essentially are gonna pay that because it's gonna get funneled up back to the, to the renters. We've also proposed an increase to hit the business side, purely business side. So if you run a business, you have equipment, you have your, your computers, those things are gonna get taxed as well. So we've tried to spread it around through everybody so that everybody's contributing to, to the financing of the $133 million increase. In reviewing the student performance data across schools in Prince George's County, there are some schools with a high free and reduced reels, meals uh, percentage of students with higher test scores than those with a lower percentage of students who qualify for free and reduced meals. Why do we think uh, more funding will help <coughs> elevate test scores across the board. And, and how is the school system evaluating this situation? So, so some of those schools that still have high poverty have some special uh, programs attached to them or special services attached to them. And, and what we don't have is sort of that equitable piece. And so this budget was built around trying to make sure that our neighborhood schools cons, uh, neighborhood schools have the same kinds of resources. When I talked about the school-based budgeting uh, money, that's a big component of that. Um, the fact that we have gifted centers, and our poverty rate throughout the county, as, as somebody stated earlier, is about two-thirds, about 68%, 67% of all of our students. And so there's poverty everywhere uh, in our school system. The difference is that, I mean, you can still have gifted children who are, are high farms. You can still have, you know, kids in Montessori uh, programs. but. What we, what we want to do is make sure that we're focusing uh, some additional resources on our neighborhood schools like we have on some of our special programs. How do you justify asking for an increase when you have not put controls and changes in the purchasing area, namely the transportation area has been found to have one of the largest areas of waste? What have you done to correct the issues of gross waste identified by the audits? So I know we're, uh, you know, we're talking with our board. We're giving them a follow-up to the transportation report that came out, which is different than the audit. But um, we believe we have put in the controls that we need. Uh, we've been working with the, the uh, board's auditor. We've been looking very closely at the state audit reports. I disagree with the gross waste and mismanagement uh, uh, characterization of the question. Uh, there, there certainly from time to time in audits are recommendation reports, uh, recommendations in, in audit reports. Some of those we're able to implement and do, some of those not, but uh, every audit report doesn't, every audit recommendation or report doesn't necessarily uh, mean a fraud and abuse. Where they have been there, we've turned those over to employee services taken the appropriate steps and, and in terms of internal controls we've turned over uh, our chief financial officer and others our, our chief operating officer uh, uh, 
Uh, that position was acting when I got here. It's been made permanent. And uh, I, I believe that we do have the controls in place. $96 million was the amount of the uh, the budget for transportation, and we are 50 percent only using 50 percent. So I just went, I'm, I'm just following up. You didn't know. Believe me, we're going to stay here. Okay, but I no, this was sure. pertaining to that question because it was my question. I know, but we're going to be here. If the answer you receive is not sufficient, we're going to stay around here. But I want to make sure everyone gets their questions, <coughs> and that way those who want to stay and go back and forth will stay here. I live in Bowie. Why can't my child be allowed to attend Laurel's International Baccalaureate Program? There are, um, there are ways to be admitted to the programs. I mean, every one of our programs has a different mission. Some of them are open admission for kids at the school. Some of them are applications to the lottery process. So, again, we can look into your particular case, but if you were in the lottery and didn't get selected, uh, that's why it's not a lottery uh, program and you didn't get selected to program. You know, we'll have to look at the deadlines and applications and whoever wrote that question, you can see Christian Rose, we'll figure that out. Why is Prince George's County tax rate so high, yet there are 20 plus systems doing better with less? When it comes to ranking and the tax rate. Thomas answer why it's so high but to let you know, they put more money in their school system than we do, so. I mean, so we, we, we've talked about it numerous times. I mean, it's, they have higher values. You look at um, Montgomery's um, uh, home prices in March, 390 something. Howard County's was 380, Anne Arundel's was 290. We're at 224. It's, it's simple supply demand. Folks wanna go where school systems are good, and, and, and because of that, values are high. And because we still have greater needs, and I think Dr. Thornton touched upon the one piece when, when his first comments was, was the, the importance of you simply just can't look at the number of students. And, and we, we spent a long time, because I worked with him closely on this uh, under Mr. Curry, it costs you significantly more to educate free and reduced meal kids, special education kids, and limited English proficiency. That's what they studied with the, the experts for, for several months. And so we have those, those needs. Montgomery, we're, we're twice as many free and reduced meal kids as Montgomery County. And so we have to, we have the, the service needs, but we have to fund it. So if our values are lower, we have to charge more to generate the same amount of revenue to, to fund, fund these special needs that we have. You constantly talk about cuts that impact your students, special specialists, and direct contacts. Do you also plan to cut the significant overhead in the system since Dr. Maxwell? I think I answered that question already. We have less executive level people than we had during the Great Recession. We cut thousands of people out of this district, including classroom teachers. Wow. We're not overstaffed in central office. We're staffed to get the work done that we're required to do. As an engaged parent, I have had multiple negative experiences at one elementary school my children attended. On a number of occasions, the principal was offended that questions were asked about the quality of education and instruction to the point of not addressing the real issue of poor teacher performance. Can the district adopt a parent advisory group to participate in interviews for hiring good principals and good teachers? And that's a good question. So, so we have a, we have a uh, parent advisory that reports to the board, not me. They give the board input. They give the board advice. Um, and, and as for you know the principal selection, communities uh, give input on the characteristics that they're looking for at their school when a principal is being hired. And then our system looks for the candidates that we have in our candidate pool to try to match uh, candidates to the characteristics that a community has said they want. Uh, but they don't actually sit on the, in on the interview process itself. So we're getting to the last question, but um, a couple of people ask questions about grant funding that's not really directly related to um, education. Can you please see um, Tom Himmler or Linda Wilson? 
um, if you have questions about grant funding. Um, and one last question. Thank you for the common sense decisions on hazardous weather, weather days. What is the plan to continue such success in the 2015-16 school year? That's a, uh, a darned if you do, darned if you don't kind of kind of decision that we wrestle with. And I made far too many of them uh, last year and this year. Uh, but we send people out on the roads across the whole district. We have people who are assigned to areas of our district, north, central, and south, east, and west. And they go out in that weather, whatever that weather is. And they drive the roads. We also talk to some of our neighboring jurisdictions because sometimes the storms are coming from the west. And we want to know what does it look like, you know, over near uh, the Montgomery Frederick border. You know, is the storm on its way? Sometimes those storms are predicted to come at rush hour, and we're making trying to make a decision at 4:30 or 5 o'clock in the morning. Sometimes they're coming from the south, so we want to, you know, call somebody down in, in uh, you know, Virginia or Charles County or St. Mary's County and see what. But you know the. You know, then the transportation people all get on a conference call with the transportation supervisor and the chief operating officer, and then they uh, call me when they're done with that, that conversation and say, "Here's here's what we see, and here's uh, here here's here's what we see, and here's our recommendation." Sometimes I say, "Great, I accept that recommendation." Sometimes I say, "I want a little more information." what's some other district doing, or what does it look like there, or what's the real timing of the storm, what's the air temperature. Sometimes right before dawn, that temperature um, goes down just a little bit. We saw an issue with that uh, one time uh, last year. It dropped just a, a degree or two, just a hair before dawn, and what was rain turned to ice, and that created some real, real dilemmas for us. And we had one time this year where we announced a, a delay, and, and it was clear within about an hour of that decision that we needed to close, and so we came right back out and, and closed. So we're going to continue that kind of uh, diligence on it. I mean, we, we monitor it, it very, very carefully, and we get information. We get, the, we get our own information on, on weather reports. We get the county's information on it, the emergency management people's information on it, and we weigh all that and then look at actual conditions on the ground. Thank you, Dr. Maxwell. Thank you. County Executive, thank you Dr. Thornton, and thank you everyone from the community for coming this evening. Let's get everyone. <laughs> we hope you'll be sure to take with you the, the, the materials that we have here this evening, and that you will share the information that you have with your friends. Um, the county has a website that has all this information and more. The school system has a wonderful website also with great information. Um, our next conversation is going to be held on April the 29th at Nicholas Ora Middle School. We thank you all so very much and please travel home safely. If anybody wants to stay around and talk a bit, we will be right here. I'm right here. Hi. Thank you.